So with that, it's my absolute honor to introduce today Dawn Nickel. Most of you know her as Mama Dawn, and she will be helping us learn about overworking and strategies to strengthen our recovery practices in this area today. Dr. Dawn Nickel is a respected thought leader in the women's recovery sphere, and along with her daughter, Taryn Strong, is the founder of She Recovers Foundation, a not-for-profit grassroots organization that inspires hope, reduces stigma, and empowers women in or seeking recovery for substance use and or mental health challenges. Dawn is a certified professional recovery coach with a PhD and professional experience related to women and healthcare policy. In her work as a researcher and consultant, Dawn has focused largely on exploring how to best support women who experience substance use disorders, mental health issues, and intimate partner violence. The three issues that prompted Dawn to start her own personal recovery journey in 1987. Since 2011, Dawn and Taryn have dedicated their lives to developing She Recovers and its offering so that more women and more women from diverse backgrounds have access, resources, support, and freedoms necessary to cultivate individualized and holistic pathways in order to find health, sustain long-term recovery, achieve their potential, and help other women to do the same. Thank you for being here, Mama Dawn, and please take it away. I'm going to spotlight you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for taking on this Mental Health Monday um, project. Lisa is at home with baby Ezra and uh, she's, you know, they're doing well and I'm sure we'll be sharing pictures and I'm just leaving it to Lisa when she has time to share, but uh, one of our team members, Lisa, who's been really foundational in creating and supporting the Mental Health Mondays along with Kelly is off on maternity leave right now. So, Uh, and Carrie, it's wonderful to have you here as co-host there and I appreciate it and I appreciate anybody who's joining thank you uh workaholism is one of my favorite topics to talk about you know I am a woman in long-term recovery from substance use disorder mental health challenges and intimate partner violence but about 20 years into my recovery journey I actually developed a pretty pretty severe case of workaholism and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment um, so my name is Don Nickel, and I am one of the founders of the She Recover Foundation. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm really grateful to live on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples here in what is now called Victoria, British Columbia. And I'm extremely grateful to be able to work, live, and play on these lands. And I do recognize and acknowledge that my being able to do so has come at a high cost to the original inhabitants here. So um, for many of you, you may not really know my story and others of you will probably be bored with me talking about it a little bit again. So today's focus really isn't on my story, nor is it on the um, really the description and kind of, I, I don't wanna belabor what workaholism is. Um, uh, last year in the fall, I don't remember what month it was, perhaps it was October, maybe it was November. I did a masterclass with our partners, um, Pathlight Mood and Anxiety, Center. So this is the link to the masterclass that I did with um, a colleague at Pathlight, and it, it's called Burnout When Overworking Stops Working. And that is really, it's a wonderful introduction to kind of all things workaholism. Today, I really want, really want to focus on practices to address overworking and workaholism. So it's slightly different. And I do recommend if you, if this is a topic that is of interest to you, and in particular, if this is a topic that is vital to your well-being, if you are an overworker, then please do go back, watch the masterclass kind of as step one. And then today's presentation will actually hopefully get you into the, um, the solution, right? There's always a solution in recovery. There's always a lot of different solutions. And I'm just going to be focusing on one modality that's been really helpful for me. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, So thank you to Carrie and Kelly or whoever actually created this graphic so that I didn't have to work too hard on my first slide. Thanks. And this is the masterclass from the Say It Brave series, When Overworking Stops Working. And as I said, I have shared the link here in the um, webinar. And if Carrie or Kelly, if you can just also grab it and put it on Facebook, that would be great. So what is workaholism? So it's really just a term that we use kind of colloquially. It's been around for a long time, since at least the 60s, maybe early 70s. And it's used to describe people who are addicted to work. Now, I use the term workaholic all the time. I know that some people have issues with anything that ends with an ick. However, for me, it's just, it's how I describe myself and I'm happy to do that. Other people who are less um, comfortable, you know, might say I'm 
I'm a person who overworks. You don't have to adopt a label. And, and I don't use the label as my identity. It's just one aspect of who I am, just like I am a person in recovery from substance use disorder. I'm also in recovery from workaholism. Fassel, Diana Fassel talks about a person whose life is characterized by incessant, keyword incessant, internal and external activity with the underlying belief that if they were not always active, they would have no right to exist or to be. And I think it's really important to note this difference and keep this in mind as we kind of go through things. It's internal and external. So it's not just the time, if I'm overworking, and yesterday I'm, I'm actually, I would say on a scale of one to 10 with my workaholic, workaholic tendencies, I'm probably at about a 7.5 pretty good out of 10. And it's more kind of sporadic. So I don't binge work so much, but sometimes I abuse work. I don't really know how to put it on that kind of spectrum, but I, I'm much better at it than I was, but I still sometimes find myself quite surprisingly in a little bit of a, a workaholic kind of surge. And yesterday was one of those days as it so happens. I just, I couldn't get away from my computer and I knew that I, I should be stopping. I should be getting up and moving. I should be drinking more water. I and I just kept working. And it was, you know, I was kind of thinking, oh, it's kind of ironic that I'm working on a presentation on workaholism while I am practicing workaholism. So that was kind of a, a wake up moment for me. But this idea that it's just external activity. So it's not just when you're on your computer or in your store or your shop or working in your, you know, wherever you do your work. It's not just that time that you count as work. If you're um, focusing on your overworking, you also have to count the time when you're driving and you're thinking and obsessing about the project that you're working on. If you're lying in bed before you go to sleep and you're making lists of things you have to do for work tomorrow, it's the first half hour when you wake up and you're just, you know, you might be getting coffee and getting washed and showered, but everything is already working. That counts towards kind of work if you're an overworker. So keep that in mind. Like any other behavioral health disorder, which I believe workaholism is, there are, there are reasons why we are adopting these maladaptive coping mechanisms, right? And every person's drive to overwork is unique and very different. And we do it to numb different emotions. And we do that differently. I love this. Sometimes overwork numbs depression, sometimes anger, sometimes envy, sometimes sexuality, or the overworker runs herself ragged in a race for attention. That I think is probably the basis of my own overworking. As a kid, I recognized in my family, which was relatively dysfunctional, um, but primarily regarding um, kind of emotional attention. So I felt like I, well, I was emotionally neglected during my childhood and into my teenage years. And so the only way that we could get attention in our family is either to act out, which my brothers, one of my brothers did regularly, um, or my second brother who was, he excelled. And I decided rather than acting out, I would go along with my second brother's habits of excelling. And so I excelled in school. I worked really hard in school because I would get attention and confirmation and a pat on the head when I did things really good in school. So that was the kind of the beginning of my workaholism, I think. Um, the other thing that happened for me was uh, when I would, had been in addiction for, I was really severely addicted to drugs between the ages of, I'd say 16 and 27. Uh, I went into treatment when I was 27 in 1987 and I haven't drank or used cocaine since. And those were my a couple of my main substances. But when I got out of treatment and I got into recovery um, and I was looking to be patted on the head again, I went back to school. I went back to university and I stayed for 13 years. And although I think that I did, obviously I was motivated by my love of learning and I was motivated by uh, wanting to have a better job when I got out the other end of it. And I was also motivated to keep going because if I stopped, I knew I'd have to start paying my student loans back and I didn't want to do that. But I really did, in effect, get addicted to going to school. And it was a form of overworking for me because I was extremely obsessed with being the best scholar that I could be, the best student. And I think a lot of that was about when I would get an A or a nine or whatever, it depends on how they were being marked. I would get this shot of, oh my gosh, I'm okay, right? And if my teachers said, oh, you're doing particularly well, or you know, pointed out to some other professor that, oh, you should hire Dawn to do this as a, as a teaching assistant because she's really great. They were just the hits that I needed for my self-esteem. And so I think that um, during school, that was when I really started to kind of, again, build towards this 
overworking workaholic lifestyle. I think for those of you who have been, who've gone back to school um, or been in school or gone back to school when you're in recovery, you'll relate to this. There's no real off button when you're in school. You don't, you don't get to say, well, it's five o'clock now I'm done studying. I'm gonna put my books away. And so again, when we're in school, we can sometimes become primed to let working, whether it's studying or working itself, to take over our lives because there's kind of no schedule. You have to get things done. Um, I'm really proud that in most of my 13 years, I think I only spent four nights not sleeping, you know, when I had to have a paper in or something. And I can all honestly say, because I managed my time very well. I mean, I managed large blocks of time doing school, but um, I think that I did okay. You know, I didn't have, I only had four all-nighters in 13 years, which apparently is a good thing. Someone, a few people have told me. Just like an addiction to cocaine or heroin or pills or alcohol or um, anything, any other addiction. We do believe that workaholics are addicted to the adrenaline high. So I, this is definitely true for me. And I just described some of that, you know, kind of um, people giving me compliments is kind of an adrenaline thing, kind of rushing to finish something, even like handing in a paper as a student or going through 150 emails in a, in, you know, in a day is like, wow, I just feel really, really hepped up. And that just kind of does what my brain needs it to do. It feeds my brain in a way that drugs used to do. So workaholism is a bit unique in that it has both a substance component, this addiction to the adrenaline, like the brain chemistry, and a process component, actual addiction to the process of working. So in February 2011, uh, all of my workaholic tendencies kind of culminated in me having an absolute breakdown. And it looked a little bit like this. Um, I had moved to Victoria, where I live now in 2005. I had just finished I had cancer, so I was finishing my dissertation, my PhD, final project for my PhD, and I ended up in the hospital, nearly died. I was within an hour of my death because I was septic from a uh, cancerous tumor perforating my colon. A week after they yanked my colon, um, I defended my dissertation in the hospital. So this is already like, this is a sign that there's something a little bit strange about Don Nickel, soon to be Dr. Don Nickel. But I really wanted to get it done, and I did. So I did that, moved here to British Columbia. And for the first year, I was undergoing chemotherapy, but I was also teaching at the university. And when I moved here, it was to teach full time at the university. And because I had cancer, I shouldn't have taught at all. Um, but I did. I taught one class in the first semester and three in the second. So again, just more signs that something isn't quite right with Dawn. When I finished, um, my chemo and I was well, I actually was headhunted into a, an executive position in government where I was working full time, uh, leading a large research team of about 24 researchers. I was teaching at the university and I started up a consulting company where I did some research and writing consulting work on the side. So I had three full time careers uh, and I was working probably 16 hours a day minimum, most days, seven days a week. And I did that for almost six years until February, 2011. And what happened for me was, I mean, things had been kind of not getting good, it had been getting bad for quite a while. My husband wasn't really paying much attention to me because it was like talking to a wall. My daughters who had moved here specifically to be with me in case I died, uh, were kind of tired of asking me to do things with them and me saying, no, I'm sorry, I can't, I have to work. But there was this internal thing going on too. I mean, your body can only do this for so long. And so what happened to me is I started blacking out. And what that looked like was I would black out at meetings. I would like just kind of zone out, black out, um, go into freeze mode. Um, I would drive home from work and realize I didn't remember driving home or driving anywhere else that I went. And towards the very end, like it was February 15th, the day that I kind of hit the wall finally, um, I ended up bursting into tears over a period of a week twice in executive meetings with higher executives than I was. And um, some of you will relate to this potentially, but one of the times I burst into tears in front of people who I shouldn't be bursting into tears from in front of necessarily was because my executive director looked at me the wrong way. So these were all signs that Dawn needs a rest. And my doctor agreed and told me that I needed to go on a break. And I thought she meant like the weekend and take the weekend off of working. She said that I needed to take at least a couple of weeks off. And so I did that. And in that two weeks, I started to look at what was going on in my life. You know, I just finally had the space. People at work were told like not to respond to my emails because I was still emailing them. And I had this space in my life finally to say, and some of you will relate to this too, when you hit a bottom is like, 
what the F is going on with my life and I can't do this anymore. So I stopped teaching, I stopped consulting and I didn't go back to work for four months. And during that time, I started thinking about what I really wanted my life to look like. And I didn't know necessarily what that was, but I knew that I wanted to do more with women in recovery. So I started a blog talking about recovery and I, um, Taryn and I started a Facebook page called She Recovers. And I just thought, you know, this is just something I'm passionate about. I'll focus on things that I love over here and I'll stop working over here so much. I went back to my day job in government for four months. And at the end of four months, I got laid off. And it was one of the greatest gifts I've ever been given, especially because they gave me a year of severance. And I spent that year planning our first retreat and, you know, doing more thinking about She Recovers. And at the end of that year, I went back only to consulting. Um, and I actually, now what I do is consulting. I don't teach, I don't work in government. And I actually only consult part-time because I also um, do what I can with the She Recovers Foundation. It was important to me that I not be, that I, you know, really dig in. So I went to therapy for about 18 months, um, starting in February, 2011. I really needed to get to the bottom of why I thought I had to work 10 or 15 times harder than anybody else on the planet, just to be thought of as an okay person. So delved into a lot of childhood things, the things that I mentioned already, you know, just really looking for attention. Also trying to numb out things that I had experienced. I'd lost my mother, um, had a traumatic kind of, she had a traumatic illness. And so there was this period of 16 months where she was dying and then she died. And then my daughter, Taryn, who's now the co-founder. I mean, we had a trauma with her when she decided to follow into my footsteps and she became addicted to meth and cocaine. And, you know, we nearly lost her. So all these things I'd been trying to numb from, and I numbed with work because substances stopped working for me like back in 1987. So in effect, you know, it's my workaholism that brought me to this passion project called She Recovers. And, um, there have been times over the last 10 or 11 years where I found myself just doing She Recovers, a passion project, not earning money at it at particular moments and still being a workaholic. So um, for those of you who are thinking, well, I mean, I am a volunteer, but I don't get paid. So I'm not a workaholic just because I do it five days a week. This can still apply. And as I said, I'm talking a little bit about what happened yesterday. The struggle still remains for me. It's something I have to be quite cognizant of. However, I will tell you that today, I recognize it almost immediately when I feel like, okay, I'm overworking. My body tells me I get anxious. Um, I kind of get a little bit hyper, like start talking fast and doing other things. Um, I get dehydrated because I stop drinking water and take a sip of water right now. And I really trained my body to give me the signals I need to know for when I need to stop. And, and it works pretty well. As I said yesterday, it was a little bit ironic that I, I knew that I was, I'd worked too many hours and I should stop, um, but I just kept going. So what I'm going to focus on today is actually um, a program called the Workaholics Anonymous Book of Recovery is where I'm drawing the, uh, the practices that we're going to be talking about from. And disclaimer, my own recovery is in 12-step recovery. I have been a proud member of a 12-step recovery program for people in recovery from drugs for 30 some years. I'm not particularly active in that program these days because she recovers is my recovery place, my recovery home. But I have extreme uh, gratitude and respect for all 12 step programs. And I get that not everybody has the same affinity for them as I do. I've never been to a Workaholics Anonymous meeting. I don't have other people I know who are members of Alcoholics or sorry, Workaholics Anonymous. And the only thing I really know about them is what I've read on the website and what I've read in their books. And I love what I've read in their books. And I've really taken um, the material for today from these books because I think they're an excellent entryway into understanding what overworking or workaholism looks like. Funny story, kind of, when I was in my extreme, like really about to lose my mind phase of working three careers and in government, uh, one of my colleagues in the office gave me my first Workaholics Anonymous book of recovery. She was here visiting for coffee the other day because she just moved back to be seen. We were having a bit of a laugh because of course she gave it to me because she could see that I was an absolute raving workaholic. And I didn't know have any reason to, I didn't understand why she gave it to me. So I didn't read it. And it ended up underneath my bed. And about two years later, a friend of mine was talking about overworking. And I said, oh, I think I have this book that someone gave me and I grabbed it and I gave it to her. And, uh, you know, it was about four years later that I actually had to order it back for myself when I was in my own recovery. The book is inexpensive. There's also a workbook that goes along with it, but you can get 
every single thing that's written in this book for free if you go to the Workaholics Anonymous website. So just Google Workaholics Anonymous and on the website, it will say literature and absolutely everything that is in the books um, will come up for you. So the reason that I am using these is because I, you know, there's so many different modalities and healing and ways to heal from and to manage we're overworking workaholism, but these just really kind of nail it for us. And, and what they do is um, they start off by helping us to understand whether or not we are a person who should be looking at our workaholism. So like many isms and like many 12-step um, programs, there's um, almost always a book booklet that says, are you a workaholic? Are you an alcoholic? Are you a drug addict? Are you a gambling addict, sex and love addict, addict etc.? So here's what I want us to do. If you are a person who believes that you may have, or if there's somebody in your life who you think is workaholic, um, let's answer these 20 questions. And if you can keep a note, just keep a tally of how many you say yes to. And again, this can be either for yourself or maybe for your partner, your mother, for your father, somebody who you know in your life. I'm gonna hazard a guess that every one of us has known somebody who overworked in our lives. So here we go. Do you get more excited about your work than about family or anything else? Are there times when you can charge through your work and other times when you can't? Do you take with you, work with you to bed, on weekends, on vacation? Is work the activity you like to do best and talk about most? Do you work more than 40 hours a week? Do you turn your hobbies into money-making ventures? Do you take complete responsibility for the outcome of your work efforts? Have your family or friends given up expecting you on time? Do you take on extra work because you are concerned that it won't otherwise get done? Do you underestimate how long a project will take and then rush to complete it? Do you believe that it is okay to work long hours if you love what you are doing? Do you get impatient with people who have other priorities besides work? Are you afraid that if you don't work hard, you will lose your job or be a failure? Is the future a constant worry for you even when things are going very well? Do you do things energetically and competitively, including play? Do you get irritated when people ask you to stop doing your work in order to do something else? Have your long hours hurt your family or other relationships? Do you think about your work while driving, falling asleep, or when others are talking? Do you read or do you work or read during meals? And that counts looking at your email on, on your phone. Do you believe that more money will solve the other problems in your life? Okay, so now let's, let's see if we have a little honesty. Who wants to share what number they rated themselves? How many out of 20 in the chat or on the Facebook live page? I'm curious to see. Okay, so we've got some, got some high, high, high ranges there, 18, 14. 15. Yeah, there you go. Interesting. And I know some of you and I'm not surprised by some of your numbers. And I'm sorry for the person who chose 20. But I will tell you that I was the person who chose 20 back in February 2011, or like it was probably a few months afterwards when I remembered to go and get the book again. I was a 20. I was an absolute raging 20. And today, I honestly will say that there are four of these that I can answer yes to. So this is a thing about overworking workaholism. We're never gonna be perfect because in large part, whoops, why is this not moving now? There you go. In large part, we can't become abstinent from work. It's like food. If there's some similarities, right? We can't like, because we have issues with food doesn't mean we can stop having food. We can't stop working. So what we're gonna do instead, we're gonna talk about some tools that I have found extremely helpful. These are tools that I will say I very much did um, employ and adopt in the early years. And I still try to incorporate them where I need to in my life today. And it's what brought me from a 20 to a four. So these are things like listening. And that means listening to ourselves means listening to our body. I talked a little bit about kind of knowing when those signs are. Um, often workaholics do have anxiety. And so if you've 
been able to get in touch with what anxiety feels like and you're feeling it, check what's going on for you around your working. I think that that's important. If you're a spiritual person and you have a higher power, then this is the point where you'd want to listen to that higher power. Prioritizing is everything, right? We've really got to make, you know, make a list of what we think we need to do. So if, again, if you are a workaholic, you're probably a perfectionist as well, and you probably are a list maker. Um, I, I'd be surprised if you identify as somebody who overworks and you're not a list maker. But prioritizing is really knowing that these are the priorities and these, you know, my, your priority list is probably, I don't know, like say there's 20 things on your priority list for any given day. And that's probably not exaggerating. You probably do have 20, some of you. And that's about looking again at that list and saying, okay, and this is going to sound scary, but what three things do I absolutely have to get done? In my own life, I actually have narrowed it down to two. So I'll do the list. And I did that yesterday. So what happened for me is I had a list of seven things yesterday. I identified which two things I really had to do, but one of them took way longer than I thought it was going to. So I did end up not stopping until I finished the two things, but I probably, you know, I, I should have done better at guesstimating how long one of those two things was going to take. So substituting means that if um, I've got, for instance, right now I have um, some speaking engagements in March and they've just kind of come up because it's history month, women's history month. And we're also hosting um, or co-hosting partnering with another wonderful organization to host a round table for women in recovery on March 8th, which is international women's day. And I've got uh, you know, so I've got three confirmed speaking um, dates in March. If somebody comes along and asks me to do another one, I have to say no, because I am only going to do three in March. And so if one of them is canceled, I can take one on. Otherwise, I can't. Um, under scheduling means this is what I should have done yesterday. Always allow for more time than we think. Because yesterday, one of the things that I did do is I took a break in the middle of the day, which is a good thing for an overworker, but it actually ended up meaning that I had to work until eight o'clock last night, and I would have preferred to have stopped at five or six. Playing is really hard for people who overwork. Um, I know it was for me. It was hard for me when I was a mom in school to stop and play with my kids who were just in, you know, they were probably in kindergarten to all the way through to grade 12. The entire, Taryn went, started when I went back to school, she was in kindergarten, she graduated about, you know, a couple of years before I finished my PhD. Um, but playing is important in that if you have kids or grandkids or dogs or cats, then you have a built-in play buddy and you just, you kind of just need to schedule that playing in to stop, walk your dog, play with your dog, play with your grandkids, those types of things. Concentrating seems like kind of a no brainer for us. You should concentrate. If you, uh, it is an excellent tool, but really what this is about is concentrating on doing one thing at a time. So not multitasking, concentrate on what you're doing. And so that might mean if you're writing something, you're writing it, you're not writing a sentence and then checking your email and then checking the web and, and going on and so forth, but really just concentrating on one task at a time. Pacing, again, a lot of these around, around um, timing, but pacing is very much about just stopping to rest before we get tired. So rather than just running through something, it's, it's about pacing. It's about interrupting your own working to take a breather, have a glass of water, cup of tea with nothing else going on, quiet and down. Um, I do transcendental meditation, not religiously and not as often as I should, but that's like a 20 minute break in a day. And that's really helpful for me. Relaxing, I think is pretty well self-explanatory, um, but relaxing kind of also means like just relaxing into what you can reasonably expect yourself to do and not accepting pressures that other people put on you. Just really having a relaxed kind of attitude to things, right? Not picking up on other people's stress or other people's. Um, and I get that when you work with clients, regardless or patients or whatever your job is, where it's other people kind of dictating your work, that this is really difficult. And you're not going to be able to use all of these tools right off the bat but there's going to be probably a couple of them. And I'm going to recommend that you at least choose two to try just to experiment with. Accepting means we accept that nothing is perfect. And that means that when we send off that proposal or that PowerPoint, or even finish that email, 
that we're not absolutely perfectionistic about it. We, we, we might even know it could be better, but you know what? It's close enough. I need to stop now. It's good enough. And what I always think if you are a perfectionist is our good enough is often considerably better than somebody who really has a better attitude towards what good enough is, right? There's kind of, it's just different standards. Our standards are too high. We need to start lowering our standards of ourselves if we are to heal from overworking. And then uh, there are a few more, but I've, I've only concentrated on 10 in this presentation, but asking, and this means asking for help. This is recognizing we don't have to do everything ourselves. We can ask others to help us. And again, this is something that um, I think probably was really what put the nail in the coffin of my um, overworking and my eventual breakdown was any single thing that needed to be done, regardless of if it was my consulting or at school or in my office, I would do it. I would take it on and I would tell myself, well, I can do it better and faster than they can. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it. And I would say things like, oh, it'll take me longer to, this will sound familiar to some of you. It will take me longer to explain how to do it than to actually do it myself. That actually isn't true. That actually often isn't true. Um, in Workaholics Anonymous, there is this um, practice that they talk about calling called bottom lines versus top lines. And these are um, a practice where you define the point where you cross over from abstinence to work addiction. So you define for yourself, like, what's your bottom line? What like, and, and you can be honest about this. So for instance, the bottom line, this is not my bottom line anymore, but one of my beginning, um, back when I started to heal, I had this thing where I decided I wouldn't work more than six days a week. And six days a week is still one day more than a person ought to work, but I couldn't go from working every day to working five days a week. I tried, I had to reset my bottom line. And so I set it to, I don't work more than six days a week. Today, I will tell you that what my work looks like, and now I've got, so I've got She Recovers and I've got um, my paid consulting work and I've, I'm writing two books. And what that looks like is I work for an hour on my book in the morning. I work a maximum of five hours on my um, paid consulting work, not every day though. And then whatever days I, whatever hours I have left, during the week are on She Recovers. So I try to spend like a maximum of 25, 30 hours on She Recovers and a maximum of 20 to 30 on work and then some writing. It's still more than I should be working, but I also end up taking like big blocks of time off. Like I generally don't work on weekends. I did yesterday. Um, something that I adopted just a few years ago was this um, not allowing work to encroach upon time committed to family. And that doesn't mean all time committed to family. I'm still like, I still say, no, I can't because I have to work to some things. But if I go to the park with my husband and our grandchildren or one of our grandchildren, I don't take my phone. So I focus on pushing someone in a swing or chasing them around the park or just watching them play and enjoy themselves. And I'm not on my phone checking to see what's going on. So these are just a couple of bottom lines that I use. And, and there's more, you know, you can set your own. And for everything that I'm talking about here, again, all of these tools and information about these tools is available on the Workaholics website. You can download them as a PDF. It looks like this. So, um, and there's just tons of great documents. The other is top lines. And this is about what, you know, setting our top lines. Like, what are we shooting for? These represent our goals and visions. So again, back in the day when I stopped, my, my bottom line was I won't work more than six days a week, but my top line, my goal was I will take two days off per week, which I eventually did get to. And it didn't take me that long, I don't think, once I got back into working. It took me a while once I got back into working after my break of, of a year, I got back to work and then, you know, kind of things got crazy again in my life. And I had to rejig re it. And that's kind of what it's about. It's about negotiation always, it seems for me. Um, and then I got to, you know, my other top line was when, when I was going to take two days off per week, that usually meant like a Wednesday and a Sunday because I couldn't go five days in a row away from my work. Again, I just have this sense that things were going to fall apart. Um, so my top line, my really, my top goal was to take off two days in a row per week. And I really do believe that, that I achieved that relatively. Um, it didn't take me that long, maybe a year. 
but it feels good. And I really try not to work. And this is where, you know, the writing the book thing gets a little bit tricky because is that work? It is really, I'm using my brain. I'm using those things. So um, when I'm really doing things right, I'm not even writing my book on the weekend. Okay. If you do this work, things will change. Think about those 20 questions. And I will tell you that uh, you'll come back and you'll, you'll do that 20 question thing again. And maybe you'll be at an 18 or a 16 or a 14 or a 12 or a 10. And, and eventually after 11 years, it's taken me 11 years, you'll be able to answer with, you know, four, yes to four of them. The characteristics of recovery look a little bit like this. We're able to speak with phrases such as, I do not know, or I was wrong, or I made a mistake. Hard things for overworkers. We come to believe that many people can do all or most of what we do as well as we can or even better. I will tell you that as someone who, um, you know, Taryn and I started the She Recovers movement and then the foundation, then we had a business, She Recovers LLC, and then She Recovers Foundation. And in the last two years, since we became a nonprofit, it's been all about stepping back and letting the amazing team who runs everything in the foundation, we're still involved and, and do particular things for the foundation, but they can do it as well in every regard and better in many. Case in point, Mental Health Monday. Thank you, Kelly and Carrie and Lisa. Uh, we come to realize that no matter how fast or efficiently we work, there are still are only 24 hours in a day. We respect our bodies. So this is like where we start listening to our body. We say no to things. We can refuse requests. We can say no without feeling guilty. This is something that I really had to learn. Um, and probably in only the last few years have I really, I get comfortable now when I say no. It's kind of like it's a, it's, a, it's not even a, no, I'm sorry, I can't because it's really a just, thank you for thinking of me. I'm sorry I'm unable to do that this, at this time, but thank you. Uh, I love this one. We realize that it's okay to be inconsistent. We find our own mistakes a continuing source of humor, uh, which is a far cry from when we are being perfectionistic and overworking and making a mistake can send us to our bed with deep depression and anxiety. And finally, we value joy over efficiency. I think I missed one there, and that is the delegate and, and lower our performance standards, but I think I've talked about them already. These are some books that I recommend people who are interested in this topic, whether it's, again, whether it's for yourself or for somebody in your life. Um, there's a book called Workaholics, The Respectable Addicts, Chain to the Desk, Working Ourselves to Death, uh, When It's Never Enough, Daily Reflections of a Work Addict is written by a lawyer, So, but it really is quite adaptable to any profession, anybody who's working uh, anywhere, really. I think it's awesome. Breaking Up with Busy, Real-Life Solutions for Overscheduled Women and Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. They're all pretty great books, I think. And I just want to end by saying that one of the, um, if you're going to go on the website, and I hope that you do, if you have a chance, um, there's also a wonderful document called Affirmations for Workaholics. And when I went back to work after um, I had my breakdown, and then I was only there for um, a few months before I got laid off, I had this posted up above my desk and I would look at it often but just a few of them are really awesome the less I struggle the more open I am to inspiration the more I take it easy the more I accomplish when I take time I make time the more I take my time the more time I have to take I don't have time not to have time a little bit of a mouthful the slower I go the faster I grow and emotions are information I honor their important messages and that is my presentation for today. As I said, please do go back to the Pathlight um, presentation if you kind of want. So it, it'll be a little. There'll be some things that are uh, that repeat what I talked about here, but I we really didn't go into depth about the um, the practices, and the focus wasn't on the resources that are offered by Workaholics Anonymous. So thank you, Dawn. That was amazing. I learned so many things about myself just from listening to that short presentation and those questions. I think we all have a lot to think about and new resources to explore, which is awesome. So we do have some questions coming in. Um, let me say the first one, let you get started on answering some of these. 
The first one is why do we have to work harder than everyone else to feel worthy of being okay? That hits hard. Yeah. And that's, you know, as I said, I I mean, it took, when I got into recovery from substance use disorder, I ended up in therapy. I, I was in treatment and then I went to therapy and I was, it was, I was in therapy for 18 months really to understand why I had set out to and almost completely destroyed my body and my life with drugs and with all sorts of other behaviors that were very um, risky. So, and that was the first layer, you know, that was the first layer I needed to stop using drugs. And then these other things came up. And so when I ended up being very firmly diagnosed with, the thing I didn't mention was what my doctor said to me when I went and saw her and she said, I needed to take time off after I was breaking down in meetings, she said, she wrote a, um, a note for me to show to work that said I needed to be off for a period of time because I had GAD, generalized anxiety disorder. And I said, um, oh yeah, that's good, that'll work. And she looked at me and she said, yeah, but you do have generalized anxiety disorder. And this was, you know, again, I'm 20 years into my recovery and nobody had ever told me that. And so then it was another layer of, well, what's this anxiety about? And, and really I back to the therapist for 18 more months and I really did uncover just more things about my childhood and about, um, you know, also things that I hadn't processed as a, as a young adult moving into adulthood with my children, with a previous, I mean, I, I was in a relationship um, that was violent for several years. So I had so much to process. And anytime we're exhibiting behaviors that are putting us at risk, whether it's substances or gambling or um, eating disorders, any of the things there's always some, some element of underlying generally trauma that we need to explore. And so my workaholism just gave me an opportunity to explore deeper and further. And I'm grateful for that. And, you know, and again, as I, I really want to stress that we can't be abstinent with workaholism. And so it's even, it's, and I say this to people who are in recovery from substances as well, we can't achieve abstinence while if we haven't until we've really under uh, dealt with all the underlying issues that drive us to using those substances or whatever. So that's why when people relapse on substances, I always say, well, it's your coping mechanism. Of course, you're going to relapse. Of course, you're going to use drugs or alcohol. Alcohol is a drug, I suppose, until you can replace what those um, feelings and, and, and those tendencies with something healthier, you're going to go back to what you know, what, what, what works. And we numb to protect ourselves. I think the hardest thing for people to understand is that, or people who don't understand addiction is like, you can't just put a person, you can't just take, you can't tell a person, okay, there's no more drugs or alcohol for you. Now just go and exist without that. There's, they've got to replace it. Um, so I, I would say that it's important. Therapy is really, I guess what I'm saying is therapy is important. Now, it just so happens that we do have, and this is not, if you, if you need a therapist and you don't have one, um, and, and there aren't any free therapy, a lot of communities do have free therapy, although I understand during these days, it's almost impossible to get in because there's so many waiting lists, but we do have a relationship with BetterHelp, which is an online um, therapy. And if you use our code um, we, we we believe therapy is important and so you get a 35 percent discount on what i understand are already really quite reasonable rates for therapy so that's one option yes so what i'm hearing is there can be a lot of underlying things going on whenever you have a behavior that's not necessarily serving you anymore um, overworking is just one of those things that could be manifesting because of something else. And I think that it's interesting that this person brought that forward, the sense of being okay, because that really resonates with me and I'm sure with a lot of other people. But I think a lot of times working is tied to our worth as a person, um, which kind of ties into another question that we received, which was, um, do you think overworking is the result of living in a society that associates personal worth with productivity. Absolutely. And I, you know, I didn't really get to speak to that too much because I think I, we spoke to it a lot in the, in the other presentation on the masterclass, but absolutely. This isn't all just driven by the individual, yeah, right? We can work and some, some of the books and somebody's asked for us to post the books. I'm going to post them in, um, 
in our She Recovers Together group. I hope everybody is, is a member there. That's where it's easiest for me to post it because I can't kind of do it now and also talk. But absolutely. I mean, um, and so it's why we talk about workloads being the acceptable addiction. You know, people actually are celebrate. If you're success, if you think about people who are, who are, who are deemed successful in business, it's because they've, they work, they've worked so hard, right? Um, and they continue to work so hard. And it's worse for women, I believe, because there are just so many more expectations on us. And in particular, during this time of COVID, we are all quite familiar with, um, it's not only women, it's also non-binary, non-binary individuals. And I think that, you know, single dads have as hard a time of it as women, et cetera, in cer certain circumstances. But it's definitely about the society, a society that thinks that success looks like hard work, right? We always talk about hard work pays off, you know, all of those things. So it's, it's, it's kind of embedded in society and in the language and the messaging that we receive as we're growing up. You know, you will succeed if you work hard. You will have a successful business, but you're going to have to devote everything to it. You're going to have to throw everything at it. Um, so yeah, absolutely. and they always, when you meet someone new or like one of the first questions you are asked is, well, what is your job? What is your career? Um, yeah. So it's definitely a defining part of who you are as a person, I believe, in our society. Okay, so next question. Um, some of these recovery statements feel risky because we believe we must be our best in order to keep our jobs or move up in our career. What is your advice on this and how can we not act out of that fear? So I think they were talking about the statements that were um, recovery oriented that you were going over there at the end. Sorry, can you repeat the first part of that question? Sure. Some of these recovery statements feel risky because we believe we must be our best in order to keep our jobs or move up in our mm -hmm. career. What is your advice on this and how can we act not out of fear? Yeah, you know, I'm always going to default to this, but it, it is really about understanding that that fear. You know, again, if you are if you are an overworker or workaholic, chances are you're a perfectionist. Chances are you're doing such a great job that the fear the fear of failure, feel that you know that everything is going to be taken away from you because you can't do it, may may be a belief system that isn't based in reality. That's one side of it. The other truth is that in our jobs, especially if we work for clients who expect certain outcomes or, you know, those types of things is that there, there may be a time where we do something wrong. We make a mistake. We screw up majorly. Like we mess something up really badly and we lose that contract. We lose that money with the, that contract. We, you know, something happens to our reputation. I mean, this is worst case scenario, right? If we're truly in recovery from this, we understand that this, this work, this profession, this job, this company does not define us and that we are human and that we made a mistake and it went really badly, but that mistake doesn't define us either. Um, and I think it really is getting to that point where, where that really deep acceptance of being okay, regardless of what we do, and understanding that we're okay just because of who we are. We don't have to do anything for our worth. Our job is not, our value is not based on our job. It just isn't, or what we produce. That's not what matters about us. Yes, I think that's the most important message of this entire session, honestly. And it's contrary to what so many of us grew up being told and what we've learned. So it's really hard to like unlearn what we have thought was true our whole lives and change it and really understand that we're worthy no matter what, what our, whatever our job is, no matter how many hours we work and regardless of making mistakes. So thank you. Um, okay, so our next one, these were actually two statements that were on the Facebook live video, but I just thought they would be good to bring forward because I'm sure you have some advice on these because they were similar. Um, the first one was having to rely on someone else is really hard. And the second one is I feel like it won't get done if I don't do it myself. Yeah, maybe it won't. 
or maybe it won't get done to your standards. And what does that look like? You know, I think that a, a good practice, another practice that I kind of, that isn't in the Workaholics Anonymous um, is I play what if. Okay, so what if, um, and I did this yesterday, I don't like PowerPoints and I don't like ugly, ugly PowerPoints. And all I can really manage to make is ugly PowerPoints, like simple, like I'm basic, like cut, cut and paste text in. But PowerPoint has this little thing where it says, come up with a design. Anyway, yesterday I was just in another, in another, and what I recognized that was growth about me yesterday was a year ago, even I would not have done this presentation without having our, one of our graphic designers create the deck because I, I just, you know, because of that level of perfectionism. So I guess for me now, this isn't really answering that question at all, but it, it, it's just this balance between my dad is 91 years old. And when he was in his sixties and seventies, he used to live on a golf course and there was a bunch of old, sorry, not old, elderly retired fellows running around. They had a great time. They, and they would help each other with projects. They would help each other build decks. They would help each other build, you know, put on um, a panel, a room or do a sun room or something or move a tree, dig out a tree. And they kind of became this gang of elderly fellows running around, really enjoying themselves. And they, my dad decided one day he would get them all hats and he went out and he got them hats and he came home and everybody got a hat and it said close enough construction. And it's just always, always resonated with me. I loved it because I mean, they just, yeah, they, they were not great at what they did. It took them way longer than, than a professional would have. But in the end, it was close enough. They had what they needed and they were proud and they got to spend time together doing things. And so I really, you know, I've just, that stuck at the back of my head. And when I was um, embarking on my recovery and work all is from work all is, I, I kind of thought one day in a, in a meditation, it came to me, oh, it's close enough. It's close enough or good enough. And so I really use that principle in my things now. And that doesn't mean, again, that doesn't mean that the work I'm producing for clients that are paying me great money to produce research and writing projects doesn't mean they're not getting, it means that my good enough, my close enough is excellent, right? It, if, if you are a workaholic, if you are a perfectionist, you don't recognize how good your work already is. So it's about good enough. Like, is this good enough? And it's only good enough if at the end of the day, last night at six o'clock or sorry, at eight o'clock, I was done because I wanted to watch a Netflix thing that we're just absolutely obsessed with called normal people. That's kind of weird, but I like it. And my husband was waiting for me to stop working so that we could watch our, uh, so we could binge our Netflix for a couple of hours. And I still had this PowerPoint that I didn't love. Um, and I just could with every ounce of being no, it, again, it's the stories. I'm like, it's good enough. It's close enough. It looks all right. It's not great. It's not as pretty as Carrie or Kim or somebody else would have created for me, but it's good enough. And today, as I go through and I realize, oh, there's one little slide there that I forgot to delete. I didn't have an anxiety attack. I didn't feel like terrible about myself. I just went, you know, that's okay. It's, it's okay. And again, I don't think I'm answering these questions. I'm just going off on tangents, but that's but okay. because there's only one principle. Yes. I think and it's good enough, close enough. Right. Get it done. And one of our other questions, it's kind of in the same vein. And I don't know if you wanted to elaborate more, kind of just keep it to that same answer was, I feel like it's okay to make mistakes that only affect me, but it's harder when they affect someone else there are different degrees of mistakes. And of course, obviously, if we're dealing with people's lives or children's lives in this case, as I know this person is, then that's not the time to lower your standards of professionalism. I'm not talking about those types of standards. I'm really talking about lowering our perfectionistic standards. And, and again, I just go back to, we do our best, you know, like it really is, we do our best in everything we can do. And we know what our best is. And so we do our best and maybe we just try and tamp it down a little bit so that we don't have to do our absolute best. We can just do our best. We can do our good enough, close enough best. Um, when other, when, when others people's lives are not 
in um, in jeopardy or at risk, I think. I think it's just there's just different degrees related to all of it, depending on what your work is. My husband yeah, used I, to say to me when I was active in my workalism, he'd say, well, he said to me one day, he said, you do realize that you're delivering research projects, research products, not blood services, right, Don? It was, it was impactful. Yeah. And I think it also, in terms of mistakes, assuming we're talking about non-life-threatening work, it's also tied up in like people's expectations of us and what they will think or what the consequences would be if a mistake is made. So I think it's all, like you said, part of the same underlying issue. Um, so let me get through, I think we have two more questions we can get to before we close it up for the day. Um, so we had a few questions and I'll just say one of them because they're kind of like all similar, which is good. They're about having the identity wrapped up in your work. Um, and so here's one related to that. I had to unravel my identity as it related to my work of many decades. I left that job 1.5 years ago and I'm so grateful. Um, there have been so many layers to that career and what was tied up in there. I had a wonderful mentor to urge me. Um, oh, I guess this is like just saying that you're very inspiring, Don. Um, but so I would like you to elaborate on identity being tied up with um, yeah. a job and how we can maybe separate those two. Yeah. Well, that definitely, you know, is what happened for me, right? I, I told you a little bit about my identity as a, as an honor student. You know, that was just, that's how that fed me, that fed me because I was getting, you know, I was getting love, so to speak for what I was doing. And so that carried over into my work and it, it is our identity, I guess. I think that the project of recovery and the practices that make up our recovery, which are all individualized, we all do different things. I think they're intended to really strip away all of that, all of that false identity things, you know, like that we're not, that we're a whole bunch of different things. So I am, I have a PhD. I do wonderful consulting work for clients in government. Like I, and I do that. That's, that's what I do. That's what I do. I'm the founder of She Recovers. And what does that mean? That just means that I started a Facebook page 11 years ago and it took off and it was, and it's been built and expanding because of all of you, not, you know, and, and some effort of Taryn and I, of course, in the beginning. So that's another element of my identity. Um, I do speaking, so I'm a speaker. I, I do events, I, like I do all these things. I'm a mom, my grandson is actually outside right now. I think my husband said he's not allowed to come in because I'm on a call and my office flooded. So I'm in my living room, but um, I have all these, we have all these different identities and yet those are not who we are, right? The project of recovery is figuring out who we are when we aren't all of those things that are parts of us that we're not just that thing we're not just I used to think I was just an addict in recovery you know when I was in 12-step recovery that was my identity you know and I went to a therapist who said tell me about yourself and I said oh I'm an addict in recovery and she went well that's not who you are and I was like well yeah it is and you know that began the process of understanding that I didn't need that label and I didn't need to use it and that yes I had addiction problems that I was no longer engaging in but it's just it's really just a stripping around of who am I I'm Dawn I'm Dawn and I have all these things that I do and I have all these things that I love and I have all these people that love me and put up with me. And, you know, at the end of the day, nothing defines me except my, my heart, my intentions, my goodness, my warmth, my, my passions, you know, but, but doing those passions is not what defines me. Loving the things that I love, loving women in recovery, loving this community. That's, that's a lot about me, but it's not everything about me either. I'm not just, she recovers. I'm not, you know, I'm just, it's a part of me. It's what I love. Yeah. I think that's beautiful and so true. And I think we've had so much to think about today with identity and someone else mentioned how self-esteem is tied up in that, what can be tied up in our careers and our working and I think those questions and those comments you just made, Don, just make, give us another way to question and look at us, look at our inner selves and who we really are and who we want to be in this world and how we like navigate it as we navigate recovery. So I think yeah. that's beautiful. And actually I feel very hopeful from this. Not, uh -huh. not like I, you know, you know how you can get into shame of thinking about overworking or, oh no, I answered 18 to those 20 questions. Yes. Um, so 
I hope everybody else feels the same way in terms of- They're just of- indicators, right? They're just indicators yes. for where you might want to look and do better, but nobody expects anybody to get down to zero out of those 20 questions. Right, really exactly. Do. Well, thank you so much. I think we're going to end there since we are a few minutes over already, but I just wanted to get, make sure to get as many questions in as possible. So I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dawn, for your time, your heart, your experience, and sharing all of this with us and these awesome resources. Thank you to those who made this make this series possible. And most importantly, thank you to all of you for showing up today, holding space, and bringing forward your questions. We truly are stronger together. Next Monday, we have author, speaker, and coach Lizzie Jackson Barrett, who will be talking about how to recover from the belief that it's your responsibility to look a certain way. Really excited about this one. So please join us. And thank you so much.